Hi there. Welcome to the Brains and Banter podcast. I am so thrilled to be here with Dr. Daniel Miller. He is uh, such a good friend of mine, uh, an amazing professor and human being. Um, he's the chair of the Department of Religion, Society and Culture at Bishop's University. Very well loved as a professor and as a person. So thank you so much for being here, Daniel. Thank you. I'm. I'm. It's a pleasure and an honor. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I can't wait to talk about. So we'll be talking about uh, something you've created called um, augmented uh, lecturing, and it is so. Um, it's dynamic. It gives you this like feeling of immediacy. Um, I think it's it's a very revolutionary idea that'll be so helpful in academia and particularly as you'll talk about in the humanities. Um, so to begin, do you want to give us just your academic background and kind of what the origin story of augmented lecturing is, how it came to be? So I started off actually in English and political science at the University of Toronto, moved into the study of religion, um, then did a master's in ancient Near Eastern religion at uh, U of T and then ended up in Near Eastern studies at, at, uh, at Michigan. Uh, University of Michigan. So um, that's my um, scholastic journey. And uh, I've always loved The Simpsons. And I always loved Monty Python. And being Jewish, we grew up with humor. And I learned from my father, who was in advertising most of his life, and now from my eldest brother, who's also in advertising. Both of them have been creative directors. My dad started an advertising agency. Um, and both of them used humor when they're creating ads because they've recognized that something that's witty and clever and makes the audience laugh is something that will be remembered. And so what I would do in my early years of teaching is I would bring in a, a VHS tape because like the nerd that I am, I had recorded the Simpsons, I had a whole archive of, uh, of VHS tapes. And I would bring in a VHS tape because I knew that The Simpsons or Monty Python or some, something like that, sometimes Blackadder, had talked about something that I was lecturing about. And at the time, of course, all we had were VH VHS and VCRs. And I would bring in my VHS tape and I would close the blinds and I would bring down the screen and I would fire up the machine and chunk into in with the tape. And every time you do that, it would, you know, kind of rewind three seconds. And so it never started at the right place. I knew where I wanted it to finish and I would stop it right at the time. And the idea was to just sort of provide this extra little bit of uh, layering to what I was talking about. And the students really really liked it. It took like five minutes to do to show 15 to 30 seconds or whatever, but the students liked it. They weren't listening to me drone on for that time. And so I was sort of known as the guy who would bring in his VHS tapes and use the VCR. And then uh, quite by accident, I found out about something called the VCR 2 PC. It looked like it was a machine. It looked like a VCR. And what it allowed you to do was put your VHS tape in there, hit play, and then it would take what you were playing and digitize it and put it onto the desktop of the PC. Fancy. And so I started to digitize all of my VHS tapes, and then I started to burn it onto DVDs. And, um, and at that point, of course, the technology had moved ahead, and instead of VCRs, the classrooms would have on the consoles, uh, you know, a port for DVD or, or a CD, and I started to play my clips instead. Um, but of course, it also interrupted everything to, to play the, the clips, stick in the CD, press play, all of these things. But the students really liked it. And it took less time than it did before. So I had a whole stack of CDs and DVDs um, with all of my clips and the clips were for one course or another course. And then quite, quite by accident, I learned how to use PowerPoint. Well, it wasn't really by accident, but I've always been kind of a Luddite. I don't really deal very well with, with technology, which is kind of ironic considering what I'm going to be talking about. <laughs> um, but I, I resisted. So I learned how to use, um, PowerPoint to do a particular project of creating PowerPoint slides for a, uh, a textbook. 
So my friend, Catherine Tracy in the classics department, she teaches me how to use PowerPoint. And then my wife and colleague, Michelle, tells me that, um, well, you know, uh, Apple, Mac, has a thing called Keynote. So I look at what Keynote does versus what PowerPoint does. And I'm a Mac guy and I decide, oh, Keynote's better than, than PowerPoint. So now Keynote will be my thing. But I've never been using PowerPoint or Keynote to teach. Uh, I just never was that guy. I was a lecturer and I wasn't putting putting bullet points up on a slide, even though that was the big thing in the 2000s. But students were changing. So I'm just going to stop my narrative for a moment and just talk about how students started to, to change in terms of what they expected. Because you get the release of YouTube in the mid 2000s and you get, and you get the first smartphones and you get social media coming online and it becomes harder and harder to lecture to students. And I remember I got one comment on a course evaluation that said something like this prof really lectures and it can be boring sometimes, which was really quite a gut punch. Yeah. Um, another one said something like using mainly speech is not the best way to convey information. And for that one, I just got, I got really angry and I yeah. went, I went to my colleagues and said, so we're not even allowed to lecture anymore. And then came an even probably the worst one, which was a course evaluation comment that said something like, you can tell that Miller isn't happy with what he's doing. Now we try and hide that from students. We know that some of our material isn't a material. And we know we're acutely aware that we're probably going to lose them sometimes. And it's really hard to to make something interesting sometimes, it's really difficult. For example, try making rabbinics exciting. So things are changing. Students are starting to expect something else. Their attention spans are getting shorter and lecturing just doesn't seem to be really working the same way. I'm teaching better at that point than I have five, six years earlier and I'm getting lower course evaluations. Anyway, let me now go back to <laughs> Uh, my narrative, which is that I have now learned how to use PowerPoint or Keynote. And then someone in IT, and I can't even remember why, shows me how to use iMovie. And I realize that iMovie is the way forward for showing these clips, because it means that I can take everything that's extraneous from the raw video that I have recorded and then burned onto CDs, and I can remove it. I can remove the stuff at the beginning that isn't relevant and the stuff at the end that isn't relevant and maybe even the stuff in the middle that isn't relevant. And I'm off to the races at that point because I now realize that I can target video clips and at this point, I'm only using video clips. I'm not using audio. And I also realize that you can take these clips and embed them into the keynote and have the thing just play bang, 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 bang. Very much, almost in fact entirely, like The Daily Show with Jon Stewart has been doing since the mid-2000s. This idea of saying something and then playing something that illustrates what you've said. So say it and then play it or play it and then say it and do it for maximum effect. And so I start to create these keynotes with targeted video clips alongside the maps and the, and the, and the photos and everything. And I start to realize that I can sort of lecture like the daily show and that this this is going to be the way to show my monty python and my <laughs> simpsons and everything and then and then quite by accident while i'm out running with a professor of, of psychology he told tells me he's downloaded something from the internet uh lady gaga singing with tony bennett and i say what do you mean downloaded from the internet <laughs> that you can download things from the internet video from the internet i said you can <laughs> And now I'm realizing that I can do that. I believe unbelievably that I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. And then someone at IT tells me about saying, oh, we know you like using clips and stuff. Did you know that there's this thing called Elgato video capture device 
that will hook up to a PVR. And if you record something on a PVR, you can use this to create, to put the video onto your laptop screen. And then of course, once it's there, I get to do whatever I want playing with the video. And by that time, of course, I've also realized that I can take all of my clips that I had burned onto CDs and DVDs or whatever it was and bring them all onto my laptop. So I'm starting to create an archive now of clips. And of course I'm inserting the clips, the best place it will go. You know, does it, where does it go in the lecture? Which lecture does this fit? Where would it be best to put this? I start to realize the things you can do with video clips. You can use it to anticipate something. You can use it to summarize something. You can use it to complement something you've said. You could play something and say wrong and then give them the real story. So it's <laughs> kind of for irony. You can just use it for fun, just for for comedy. So then the next thing came with the audio. What happened was I got a new computer. I could not use the old iMovie platform. So I had to watch a video on YouTube about how to use the new iMovie, the new iMovie at that time. And they talk about audio. They talk about making audio clips. And I suddenly realized like, duh, if you can do it with video, <laughs> You can do it with audio as well. Oh. And I am a singer and I love singing and I love songs and I have big this big iTunes library. And I start to realize that in the past where I would open up my iTunes and say, okay, well, I want to start at a minute 32. And I've written this in my, in my notes. So Sting will sing exactly these 14 seconds and then I have to stop it there and that's whatever. But now I realize, oh my God. All you have to do is just drag the song out of your iTunes and then bring it into iMovie. And now you've got a song clip that will illustrate what you're talking about. So now you've got video and audio. And I start to then, whenever I'm walking the dog and I hear a song and I think to myself, oh my God, that song, that song clip fits in this lecture. So I start to sort of make associations among all of these things and everything becomes becomes possible now for for my lecturing. I have never used static PowerPoints. As soon as you put them up on the screen, I think the students stop listening to you and they just start kind of trying to copy down what's on the PowerPoint. So instead, I end up with a situation in which I've got a script, that's my my lecture, and then there are cues to myself when to play the keynote, which runs concurrent to the lecture. And so I start to do, to do all of this. And I don't have a name for what I'm doing, but in 2016, having won the Humanities uh, Division Teaching Award the year before, I'm asked by the VP Academic and Research if I will represent bishops at a teaching and learning summit at Mount Allison University. And I say to the VP academic and research, I don't know anything about teaching and learning. I don't know anybody ed educational theory. And he says, but the thing you do with those clips, talk about that. And then I realize, oh my God, what the hell is that? What, <laughs> what am I doing? What is this called? And I'm running on a treadmill one day, which is incredibly boring. And my mind <laughs> to wander and I start to think about Pokemon Go for some reason which was all the rage at that time and I think to myself augmented reality augmented augmented lecturing this is lecturing but it's augmented by all sorts of different things so I come up with a with with something called augmented lecturing connecting with the wired generation and that's the first time that I called it augmented lecturing and at that point, I'm really only doing it for myself. The students are really responding to it, but I'm only doing it for myself. And I'm not really thinking about thinking others should do it or anything. But then the principal at the time, Michael Goldblum of Bishops, he gives a town hall speech in which he talks about the need for technological innovation in teaching. And he talks about the plummeting interest in the humanities and how that is a concern for particularly a liberal arts institution like Bishop's. And he talks about knowledge mobilization. And I realized that augmented lecturing is actually at the intersection of all of these. And 
So I start to think about talking about augmented lecturing now in terms of something that could maybe be used to help to create again some interest in humanities courses, which students are starting to see as being rarefied and dull and irrelevant to their lives, sort of like an academic extravagance. But what I realized with augmented lecturing, of course, is that it's bringing in everything. Everything becomes an option for the instructor. You students don't think that this matters to your life, but The Daily Show talked about it the day before, right? CNN talked about it four days ago or whatever. Here's part of a film, but only part of a film. We don't need the whole film. It used to be that the, that the instructors would just show a whole film and it was intended to supplement the lecture. But what was the instructor supposed to do at 23 minutes of the 50 minute film, break in and suddenly say, well, pay attention here, folks. This is important. <laughs> Or before the film, say something like, well, around 38 minutes in, you're going to see something that I really want you to take away from the, or after it's all over, say, remember back around minute 17? Well, now with iMovie and embedding these clips directly in to the presentation, you can show exactly what you want when you want. You're like a DJ deploying whatever will work. What clip will work best here? What will illustrate things? This brings in a whole range of possibilities. It's multimodal. And we know from educational psychology that multimodal really helps when you layer things. And also, as you said, immediacy and the relevance, the relevance, it, it just grounds everything in the real world. It's like, you thought this was rarefied. You thought this was totally ivory tower. No one would care about this except professors with long beards. But no, no, Trevor Noah just talked about it. And then I start to realize also, of course, that if Trevor Noah can do it better in one minute than I can in five minutes, and I can set Trevor Noah up, to do that work for me, wouldn't it be better for them to hear from the person they really relate to, Trevor Noah? At one point, I told a student who was really, really excited about augmented lecturing, I said, I feel like I'm cheating because <laughs> a third of the time, it's not me. It's somebody else. And she said, no, no, you're doing a different kind of work. It's a different kind of work. Just because you're not lecturing it yourself, but you've still done the work. You've curated it. So in, in a way, then, since you can download anything from the internet and all these things, of course, they're legal, uh, depending on the country. Um, Canada had a 2012 Supreme Court decision that threw all of this open for educational purposes. We're not making money from this, right? It's for education. So for education, for teaching, you're allowed to use a certain amount or percentage of a film or whatever. And of course, this is the mashup culture now. Everybody is using everything to do their, their new thing. There are songs that just simply riff off of old songs and then put in new, new, new material. So the possibilities are endless with augmented lecturing. And what it does is create this emotional connection sometimes for the students. There are times, a lot of times now, where my students will quote my clips back to me on tests and exams. I think one perfect example of this is in my Hinduism unit of the course on Eastern religions. An old clip I have from 14 years ago, something like that. It's about widows in India. And it's a searing indictment of how widows are treated in India. It's about a seven minute clip, which is long, most longer than most of the clips I will play. I don't say a whole lot in terms of the lecturing, but I play this clip and the students remember it. This is how people learn now. Our attention spans have become much shorter because of social media and the internet. We learn through audio visual. And of course, it's become clearer and clearer in the last several years that students aren't going to print any more um, media things. They're not going to articles. They're not going to books. They're going to YouTube. They're looking at Crash Course. They're looking at Khan Academy. That's where they're getting their information from. So as instructors, we have to 
keep up with that somehow. Otherwise, we're just going to be left behind. The ivory tower has been breached. We used to be the gatekeepers, but now educational material is just a click away or supposedly educational material. So we need to meet the students on the level at which they are learning, which is to say audiovisually. That's what augmented lecturing is. And you can do so many things with it. And I'm going to show you some things, um, unless you have some questions before I show you my share my screen and show you just a, an example, because I can talk about it till the cows come home. But if you don't see it in action, you don't really understand it. Yes, I would love to see examples. I just want to comment quickly. We talked about yeah. this previously, but again, just what a labor of love it is and what dedication you have it, as a teacher and like it just shows so it, is, it is a labor of love and the problem with trying to get other instructors to use it even though the students really respond to it and I'll show you some data from a survey I did I just finished a research and creative activity grant through bishops to measure the efficacy of augmented lecturing but people think, oh my God, I don't have time for that. But here's the problem. Okay, fine. You'd say you don't have time for that. But if you keep lecturing and teaching the way you have, in five years, you may be lecturing to an empty room. The humanities is absolutely plummeting. In the last 20 years, and particularly the last 10, and it's even worse since the pandemic, the humanities are tanking all over North America. And it may be the case as well in Europe. I'm going to a conference in Rome next week, actually, to talk about augmented lecturing. And I hope to talk to some European humanities instructors and see what their sense is of the humanities. Um, my sense is it would be worse in North America, which has some anti-intellectual kind of undercurrents that they don't have in Europe. Yeah, it's such a, it's, yeah, it's so, so scary and sad, but this is like, yeah, reinvigorating. I was thinking it was a good word. Like yeah, humanities. that's what I'm, yeah. I, 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 I know there's no silver bullet, but I really believe with all my heart that this could be a way to get students to value and embrace the humanities again, as they once did, by bringing it to them with these clips, showing them South Park, showing them CNN, showing them New York Times, showing them CBC, showing them something from films. We have so many options now for video and audio and throwing in a song clip every now and then. And what's even better is they're forced to listen to the music I love. <laughs> Yeah, like the other neat thing about it is it's you get to personalize it, right? So like it's this Absolutely. amazing thing Absolutely. that you can do. But yeah, I love the idea of like curating and yeah, DJing. And so yeah, all of it's amazing. Maybe what I'll do is like you say, it, yeah. it really helps to see it. So do you want to show yeah. like examples? Well, I'm going to show you first something that I created about the attacks of 9-11 of 2001. <sighs> رعبا من شمالها الى جنوبها ومن شرقها الى غربها الشعب الامريكي حديثي هذا لكم عن الطريقه المثلى لتجنب منهات اخرى عن الحرب واسبابها ونتائجها فكما تهدرون امننا نهدر امنكم on September 11, 2001, at 8.46 a.m., American Airlines Flight 11 flew into the North Tower of the World Trade Center in Manhattan, which collapsed 42 minutes later. We just got a report in that there's been some sort of explosion at the World Trade Center in New York City. You're looking at the uh, World Trade Center. We understand that a plane has crashed into the World Trade Center. We don't know anything more than that. Some Jamie, people were... Jamie, I need you to stop for a second. There has just been a huge explosion. Uh, can't, I'll, I'll tell you that I can't see that second tower. At 9.03 a.m., United Airlines Flight 175 crashed into the South Tower, which crumbled to the ground one minute before 10 a.m. Of course, the major concern is human oh loss. I mean, do you know... Oh, another one just hit. Something else just hit. A very large plane just oh. flew directly over my building, and there's been another collision. At 
At 9.37 a.m., American Airlines Flight 77 slammed into a section of the Pentagon in Arlington, Virginia. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. We're looking at a uh, live picture from Washington, and there is smoke pouring out of the Pentagon. Uh, there was a lot of confusion. Again, it appears that an aircraft of some sort did hit the side of the Pentagon. At 10.06 a.m., United Airlines Flight 93 went down in a field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, when passengers stormed the cockpit and fought with the hijackers who purportedly wanted to fly the plane into the White House or the U.S. Capitol building. A large plane has now crashed about 80 miles southeast of Pittsburgh. We don't know where their destination was, what their target was. We can only presume, we can only guess that they were short of the target. All told, the attacks killed nearly 3,000 people and injured more than 6,000. Al-Qaeda called the assault the Manhattan Raid, the Big Wedding, and Holy Tuesday. Manhattan is sealed off. If you want to get in, you cannot at this point in time. It is Tuesday morning, the 11th of September, and you will not forget this date. Yeah, okay. that is just like so powerful. You're talking about like the emotional aspect of it and That's like it. the immediacy. Yeah. Gut punch, gut punch, gut punch. If you curate the clips the right way, they carry the narrative for you. I always tell my students, I like to tell a story. I want to tell a story when I lecture. And the clips allow me to do that. And here's the thing. We're all carrying around pocket computers, <laughs> right? If you want to know particular facts, you can always look it up. So as instructors, we have to be doing something else other than simply conveying information. Because the information is available to everybody in their pocket or their pack, backpack or whatever. So I always tell my students... I want you to carry what you experience in this class well beyond the final exam, if not for the rest of your life, for much of the rest of your life. And when the pandemic happened and I took everything that I was doing in the classroom and put it online in asynchronous things, I had students emailing me saying, I'm watching your lecture with my parents, oh, wow. which is such a huge honor. And my dad has a question. <laughs> no way. It's so fantastic. <laughs> it's like, oh my God. So it's interesting enough that you would drag mom and dad over to sit at the <laughs> dining room table with you and watch your prof tell you about Christian Zionism or <laughs> LGBTQ plus uh, rights with respect to Christian nationalism. So yeah, I mean, can you imagine doing the 9-11 thing as just bulleted PowerPoint thing? Like it, or just sort of reading about it, you need to see it, you need to feel it, you need to hear it. So I'd like to show you another one called Canaan and Phoenicia. Oh, amazing. Canaan is the anglicized form of the biblical Hebrew term for an ancient place name that refers roughly to the area now covered by the modern day countries of Lebanon and Israel. During the first millennium BCE, we find a people whom the Greeks called Phoenicians living along the Mediterranean coast, roughly where Lebanon is today. The Phoenicians seem to have seen themselves in terms of their connection with their city-states, like Tyre, Sidon, and Byblos, going south to north, which are all in modern-day Lebanon. The Phoenicians were active seafarers, traders, and skilled artisans who created objects of great value that were sent to cities all around the eastern Mediterranean. The easiest way for Phoenicians to increase their prosperity was by contact with other peoples and the quickest route to new lands and cultures was the Mediterranean. Through their travels and their trading, the Phoenicians formed links with most of the known world at that time. This ship is uh, a Phoenician ship dated to 5th century BCE. Its capacity almost 15 tons. This is the place where the mast uh, was attached to this ship. The Phoenicians also established colonies throughout the Mediterranean, in Cyprus, Sicily, Sardinia, Malta, southern Spain, and northern Africa. The word Phoenicia comes from the Greek word phoenix, meaning purple. The purple here refers to the dye secreted by the murex mollusk, 
used in the Phoenicians' much sought-after fabrics. Scholars consider the Phoenicians to be the first millennium BCE descendants of the earlier Canaanites. Just as Phoenicia comes from a Greek word meaning purple, so too might Canaan have the same etymological connection to the concept of purple. Oh, oh that's, that's so great. perfect. Through watching that, uh, we've discussed this, but just how amazing it is for neurodiverse learners, um, you know, rather than just being told information and told to regurgitate it, you like you get it from different, like it's appealing to mul multiple senses and then the yeah. sense memory thing too, like in music. And so you're more likely to remember it. So just wanting to point out uh, and also sorry, this idea of it appealing to emotion and like the word motion movement is in emotion yep. and how this it's constant. Kinetic. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's fully kinetic. The yeah. whole point oh. not to click on hyperlinks. It's just to go bang, 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 bang. And the thing I want is to get a conversation started about this. As far as I know, I'm the only person doing this quite this way. Um, and maybe I'm bad at it. <laughs> if only one person is doing it, maybe that person is actually, in terms of the platonic form of it, <laughs> bad at it. If I could get other people <laughs> talking about it, they'd say, oh, no, man, you're wasting your time with this. Why haven't you done this? I'm doing what makes sense to me. Yeah. And also it's um, I love I've said this before, too, but just like the generosity of it, where it's so you were talking about gatekeeping earlier and this idea, oh, well, this is this great idea. I keep it to myself and uh, become yeah. famous from it. Instead, you're like, this is useful for everyone. Any, yeah. Anything you keep to yourself, you're not going to become famous for <laughs> But, That's a good idea. Yeah, good point. <laughs> particularly not in the internet age. What you want to do is get the, the point across, get rid of the extraneous material, get it so that the, the clip comments on a lecture unit or a lecture section. And you can do all sorts of things. I often will start a unit without talking. I will just show a clip or I will play a song clip. So, for example, when I talk about second wave feminism, I start with Bridge Over Troubled Water with Simon and Garfunkel singing, Sail on, silver girl, sail on by, your time has come to shine. That's so powerful. That'd and it gets funny. the student's interest. And there are little things like GIFs that you can use. Yeah. There's so many possibilities. So I sort of collect some of these things and the students really respond to them. They're over almost before they know it's happened, but it makes the impression. So once again, I'm just going to share my screen and show you a few. I'm going to show you not a great plan, which is something that you can use over and over. It's from the first Avengers movie. It's Tony Stark as Iron Man talking to Loki, but you don't see Loki. <laughs> there is something that I love to play when something's going to be boring. I got something from The Late Show with Stephen Colbert because they do a lot of this sort of thing. You'll find this in the, the news humor shows. It was pioneered by The Daily Show. Then John Oliver picked it up and Samantha Bee picked it up and Stephen Colbert picked it up and Seth Meyers, who was an SNL alumnus, also picked it up. They all do the same thing. And Colbert brought what he did in the Colbert Report over to The Late Show with Stephen Colbert. They will show these wonderful things. So I'm going to show you what I will show my students to say that this is going to be boring. <laughs> <laughs> tumbleweed you know just really quick and then there's this one i call it apathetic firework this one is beautiful to use when you're talking about jared kushner's peace plan in my politics and religion class talking about the israel palestine conflict and the students love this one and so jared kushner's peace plan was greeted this way by middle eastern leaders and experts yay kaboom <laughs> never <laughs> fail to get a laugh and that's perfect there's, there's not a great plan if I'm talking about Siddhartha Gautama's childhood as the Buddha and his dad who wanted him to be cut off from all evidence of suffering and that was daddy's plan but not a great plan <laughs> Ah, it's so good because it also it gets them the students comfortable right because it's it's often a difficult thing to 
to open up. And so you create this like fun, exactly. safe space. That's, eh? that's what the students want. They want yeah. us to be grounded in the real world, not not pretentious. Um, <laughs> and I just wanted to show you now some some data. So we used a Likert scale. In a Likert scale, uh, if you see it, a lot of the bar on one side or the other of the white line in the middle, that's a good sign. And here's the next one. Same thing. So I divided this for this presentation in Rome into three parts, and I took nine questions. And I call the first one interest and engagement. And you've got agree there and strongly agree. And then I've given the full the full total. So the interspersing of lecturing and audiovisual clips made me less likely to turn my attention away, 70.2. I was more motivated to attend class because I knew that the interspersing of the lecturing with audiovisual clips would be compelling, 72.4. Paying attention to Dr. Miller's presentation felt easier than following a conventional class, 80.9%. The next Lowing one, results. resonance and relatability, which sounds like a Jane Austen novel. <laughs> Dispersing of lecturing and audiovisual clips helped me to take the information from courses into my day-to-day -day, day -day life, 80.8. .8. Uh, provided opportunities for useful in-class commentary in our broader culture, 87.3. Helps me relate to the subject matter on an emotional level, also 87.3. That's huge, right? And then there's le learning and memory. The lecturing and audiovisual clips formed a complete and compelling whole, 84.8%. Helped me to form a more complete understanding of the subject matter, 91.5%, and helped me to remember it, also 91.5%. And I had a 60% response rate. Wow. Yeah, really? that is that is uh, quite clearly a glowing response from students. And again, that like memory thing too, like, because they're also, we were going to going to talk about, um, yeah, just the psychological uh, bases of these or like neuroscience, like I always talk about with engaging more yeah. than one sense makes it more likely that you're going to remember it. So yeah, that that's really amazing stuff. That's it. I'm trying to bring into academia what has been in, first of all, news yeah. um, to some extent when you had an anchor who would then throw to a to a correspondent who would then show some video. But then it was Jon Stewart and The Daily Show that really started to do this as rapid fire, bang, 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 bang. I'm trying to bring that into academia because it works like gangbusters in other areas. So why can't we do that in academia? Because we're getting killed by YouTube. We're getting killed by, by Khan Academy and Crash Course and the humanities in particular is really, really tanking. We have a course on Judaism at Bishops. When it was taught 11 years ago, there were 30 people in it. Last time, five. The courses are now being seen as at best breadth requirements. They're not being valued as being something that's an important to the student's life. Yeah. But with augmented lecturing, you keep their interest, you keep their engagement, and they get into it so much so that some of them will come up to me afterwards and say, well, here's a song, why don't you use this? Or did you see Jon Stewart last night? You could use that next time. Or have you thought about, and it yeah. may seem like you're pandering, but there's also rigor there. Yeah. There's rigor. The students come away learning a lot. I've had students, a number of students say to me, it's crazy how much I learned in your class and how much I still have. And I talk about it with my friends. And that is the greatest thing to hear. We just have so many possibilities with augmented lecturing. You can make it your own. The education guy that I sing with in the choir, I showed it to him. He loved it. He said, this is what I want to do when I grow up. But he's 40 years old, which was. <laughs> and then he used it in his practicum and the students loved it. Amazing. So younger students really responded to it as well in the way he did it. And he was using TikTok stuff. But whenever I've given presentations to older people, they love it as well. One guy came up to me and said, it was so great. You said something and then you played something that <laughs> illustrated what you. And I said, yes. I say it and then I play it, I, or I play it and then I say it. 
for maximum effect, can you be my press agent? Another person said, this should be on TV. And I said, but there's nothing new here in terms of the information. All I did was give it to you in a way that allowed you to take a lot of information and see it clearly. Exactly. And that, that is a very difficult task, though. And I mean, it just it is it is not at all uh, um, sort of catering. At, right. You're actually trying desperately to help them. And and I think that's what we need to do in education is uh, be open to change and evolving with the times. Just because we had to sit there and be lectured to for hours doesn't mean that these students therefore need that and that it's the best thing for them. So it won't work. It yeah. won't work. If you try and just lecture for 10 minutes, you'll lose them. Yeah you'll lose them. That was already starting at the end of the 2000s. And it's just it's just accelerated since then. So the humanities is so important. It's so important. It, it's, it's the human condition. There's a tech columnist for the New York Times, Kara Swisher. She interviewed Mark Zuckerberg, found out that he never took a humanities course. If Mark Zuckerberg had even taken one humanities course, he might have seen that this utopian thing he believed was going to bring the world together could be used instead to divide and hurt and harm and destroy. That Okay, so that's just like, you know, I'm obsessed with Mary Shelley's Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus. So Prometheus being forethought yeah. and foresight, and then the novel itself being like this scientist who doesn't pay attention to the humanities is coming up with this idea, but doesn't have any anyone saying you got to think about the ethical implications of this. Um, I'm doing this book club on Dr. Jessica Riddell's Hope Circuits um, and some students were on the call and we we're talking about like the relevance of teaching um, and the humanities when students can access like you were saying knowledge on their own and came yeah. to the conclusion that it's that collective community idea and that learning in isolation isn't going to allow you to grow. So what you're doing is like allowing for like the, all these connections to be made to the outside world too. I, yeah. I see myself as kind of a director. I have these very, very tight scripts that tell me exactly when to advance. So I use arrows now, for example, to tell me that I can start to show a slide while I'm still talking. The arrow tells me that's when you advance it. And whenever there's a clip coming, there's a colon. And then the, and then the thing is indicated in, in bold, in lower size font. And it tells you exactly how long it is. Then it tells you what it is. It gets the students to value the time that they're spending with you. And it, and it, it shows to them also that you're just a regular person, yep. just happens to have done a lot of studying. And if you respect them and respect their time, they're going to respect you and the effort that you put in. Definitely that. And like, I also want to bring in the the sort of really important part of it where you're doing like showing and saying, saying then showing and how education is all about uh, like repetition with variation. Um, yeah. So yeah, exactly what you're doing too is you're like rewiring to use Jessica Riddell's term, their brains. And so you, you're saying you're like connecting with the wired generation and and you so are in so many ways. Um, and again, we've talked about this like, you know, uh, commodification of attention. There's just no no room for that. And so you're making you're like capturing their attention while teaching them something valuable. And one more thing I wanted to point out was that yeah. I, I really am going to do this for sure. Uh, we talked about how like I would love to love to try and create something because I have all these things that I always want to say in my lectures and, and some of the feedback I've had is it's hard to follow the narrative. Um, where, so something like this would allow me, I have all these parts and I was like, oh, I'll bring in this video. Yeah. Um, and to think, talk about what you said earlier, I'll like show like a YouTube video, but I have to like pause it and be like, by the way, blah, 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 blah. Say again, Wait, by the way. Open, and if you, and you got to open up YouTube and then you've got to yes. get, the, and then it has to load. And then, yep. I mean, but, and even those few seconds, you lost them. Yep. <laughs> lost yes. them. They've told me this. They've told yep. me this when I ask them, is it helpful for you that this is just advancing? Bang, 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 bang. They said, yes, we can't stand it. Yeah. When we have to wait for something and then the person fumbles around with the thing and then it won't start in the right place and then it won't, yeah. and then it glitches. You give them exactly what you want them to see and hear 
and you move on to the next thing. Yeah, I had that teaching Austin and film and um, it was very clunky because I'd have these like pieces that I wanted to show, but exactly, I'd just, I just, I started this weird thing where I like, well, I'm doing something like doop a doop a doop a doop just because I'm like, at least that'll keep them entertained while I'm trying to forward to this part. And so, yeah, it's like, it's useful for so many. For, like, yeah, for so if you have your script and you have your presentation, you will go into the classroom energized because you will know the students are waiting to see what's what's she got for me today. Yeah. What's it going to be? Is it going to be South Park? Is it going to be CNN? Is it going to be the New York Times? Is it going to be CBC? Is it going to be The Simpsons? And you'll go in energized and that that will be infectious yes. to them because you don't leave anything to chance. And so there's a lot more to be done in terms of measuring augmented lecturing. And yeah. one thing that would have to be done would be to see what student response would be without the clips. But right. for me, that's yeah. soul destroying. Yeah. Lecturing, presenting now without augmented lecturing, it just makes my blood run cold. Yeah, yeah. I know what it could be. I have certain clips that I can't wait to show. Oh my God, today's the day I get to show John Oliver playing Sir Archibald Mapsalot the third. <laughs> Talk about the Sykes Pico agreement where the Middle East was carved up into states that didn't make any sense in terms of their borders. Mm -hmm. And it was brilliant. It was absolutely brilliant. It made the point beautifully. It's mm -hmm. three minutes long. It's funny as hell. The students hear from me about Sykes Pico. And then they see John Oliver do this really funny thing along with John Stewart, and they remember. Great. Yes. Whenever I go into a class and I have like you know a clip that's funny, I'm like I can't wait to get there and wait, show it to you. Yeah. It lands. Yeah. I can't see how it lands. Exactly. I'm exactly. Thinking, I'm always thinking now. Whenever I see anything in video, I'm thinking to myself, where does that go? And then that joy that it has like reflected with the students yeah. and then, yeah, the laughter part too. Like I had mentioned this neurobiologist, Robert Provine wrote science or laughter, a scientific investigation and talks about how it's like our most uh, like powerful form of human interaction because it's this brain to brain thing that's happening. So yeah, just the, like the, yeah, the human. So, this, so I see augmented lecturing as being at the intersection of so many different things, the yeah. humanities, education theory, psychology, it's everywhere. And so I've presented on it in terms of the humanities. I've presented on it in terms of um, the Bible. I've presented on it in terms of education. It's a chameleon. It really fits in a whole range of different places. The real interest I have is getting other instructors, particularly in the humanities, it'll work in other domains as well. Anyone can use it. But the humanities, we have such fascinating, important courses and students are, are going right by them and taking something else. And we're, we're lecturing to smaller and smaller groups as the years go on. And departments are closing and programs are ending and professors are being fired and laid off or no one's being hired because humanities what's what's that for i know it is it's so important that like last time they had this like crisis in the humanities this seems to be like a real answer to it um and i am like i'm 100 i can't wait to start using it and i um yeah for listeners can yeah. you tell them yeah go ahead yeah. so i did a thing on the youtube channel of the maple league and it's called Hasta la Vista Boredom. It's welcome to my online classroom. And in the last 10 minutes or so of it, I do a little tutorial using iMovie. I take the song Blinding Lights by The Weeknd and I bring it into iMovie. And then I clip out 11 seconds. I'll show you how to make it be audio and video, cool. just audio of that, or just video of that. There are tutorials online about how to use iMovie. I watched one tutorial that was 35 to 40 minutes long, and it gave me what I needed to know. And that's it. And we all learn different platforms for the pandemic. So it's really not that huge a task to be able to just master iMovie, 
know how to embed these clips. At the beginning, of course, what you're going to want to do is build up your archive. Once you make a clip, you keep it. I have all my clips stored in the cloud and on an external hard drive. And they're all by course. And within each course, sometimes they're alphabetical or they're by unit or, or what have you. And some of them will stay until I retire. I'll keep using them. Other ones work only for that one time when I'm teaching the course. And then events have bypassed that, have gone beyond that. Uh, so like the last third of every lecture, pretty much in my politics and religion class, which deals with the Middle East and the United States and Central Asia, all the clips change. Yeah, true. Um, every two years when I teach the course. And sometimes it turns out that something you haven't used in 10 years becomes relevant again. Right, yeah. You know? And you have clip still, you go back, oh my God, I think I, I kept that. And you bring it back out. And so the, 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 the presentations change. I started off with the song clips using only song clips that dealt exactly with the topic I was talking about. So if I was talking about the Garden of Eden in a course, and I used Joni Mitchell's Woodstock, where she says, we are stardust, we are golden, and we've got to get ourselves back to the garden. That talks about the Garden of Eden. But then it occurred to me, it doesn't matter whether the singer is actually talking about the thing you specifically are talking about. If they're using the words that fit, you can do it. Totally. So I'm going to use Phil Collins when somebody tries to do something but fails to do it. I'm going to suddenly start playing Mr. Again. Oh, I think I missed <laughs> again. He's not talking about my lecture topic, but there's so many possibilities. Yes, infinite possibilities. And you're, yeah, I mean, the whole point of like learning university is making connections, right? So you're just showing them. You can make connections with seemingly disparate ideas and suddenly you've connected them and so you're just teaching them how to find relevance in everything too I think is just that's so it they got to see it as relevant to their yeah. everyday lives otherwise they're not going to give us the time of day yeah yeah they're just going to sit there sullenly and go got to get through this got to get my humanities breadth requirement when the hell is this lecture over yeah yeah absolutely yeah I think it is just Remarkable, and I am going to use it. I had well, was one more thing I wanted to bring in. Okay, so we talked about employing it in the classroom, but also, yeah, so if you could, I know you said one of the main things is just getting a conversation going about augmented lecturing, but if you could like envision this like ideal future of, um, you know, and it sort of infiltrated the system and yeah, what would sort of the future look like for you? Oh, the future would look like just more people trying to just bring this idea yeah. into their classroom. You don't have to do it to the nth degree. We need to make our lectures more interesting. We need to be able to hold their attention. We need to be able to tell a compelling story. That's what the humanities is. We make connections. We make associations. In an English course, you can bring in anything. In a history course, you could bring in anything. As I say, it'll work for social sciences as well. It'll work for anybody who really wants to make it work. But it's the humanities that I'm concerned about because the others don't need the help. Yeah, and you know, I just thought of something while you were talking to when I was teaching a Gothic course, it was uh, my most recent time teaching and I'd already talked to you about this method. And so I opened the class with um, a South Park clip of the Gothic kids or whatever. Um, yeah. and just even like the glimpse of like what that could turn into just that was just, yeah, they were just like, right. it was like having a meditation before class where they're just getting focused, but instead it's just something that opens them up. That's it. And they don't quite know why you're showing it right away. Exactly. So yeah. Start, then the penny drops. There's so many different possibilities that these clips can do. Watch Seth Meyers, A Closer Look, a 10 to 12 minute thing every show, A Closer Look. He constantly is interspersing video clips. And at the end of every segment, he will bring back in something from some video from earlier in the segment and use it as the last word of the segment. Whoa. He will ask a question or make a statement and then bang, Sean Hannity or something yeah. from a Fox News thing says something at the end 
This has been a closer look. It ties it up in a neat bow. Yeah, you know, absolutely. We have a story. We have a story to tell. It has a beginning, it has a middle, it has an end. Absolutely. And you can use iMovie to just get rid of all of the extraneous stuff. Yeah. You know, I am just another, any other editing program. And yeah, if you want to download stuff from the internet, it's a 4K video downloader that I recommend. 4K video. And I'll also for listeners, viewers, I'll include uh, the links that are mentioned and the Maple Leaf uh, talk that Daniel did. So I'll include those links online too when I post this. And I also wanted to mention, uh, we'll do a, a few parts because there's so much to talk about. I feel like we just scratched the surface. Well, yeah, this has been uh, such a joy. So inspiring. Um, yes, just I'm excited to, it makes me excited to teach again as well. So thank you so much. It's a pleasure. It's an honor. You can see that I get so agitated when I start talking about it <laughs> uh, because I've seen what it can do. If people think that that they can't do it, I am not a tech guy. <laughs> I am not a tech guy. This is my third ever smartphone. <laughs> third ever. So okay. we can do this, everyone. <laughs> yes, I really believe still in the lecture format, but I know I have to bring the lecture format up to date. Upgrade it, yeah. For a generation that learns primarily audio-visually. Absolutely, yeah. I, I yeah you know, we can curse the darkness or we can light a candle. Yeah, that's perfect too. And then a lot of it is like fear of change. Everyone's so scared of change. I remember like, I had a computer and then finally got a laptop and I just left it under my desk for a year. <laughs> I was like, it's too scary. I'm not gonna be able to figure this thing out at all. So it's also just- Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, feeling that way, you still recognize the necessity of adapting and changing with the time. So even if you feel more comfortable this way, it's things will be better once you, and it also it's so exhilarating, yeah. like when you finally do learn to do something new and realize, wait, I can do this. Like even I have this elliptical machine I, I, ne I use once a year. Um, yeah. But I didn't think there was a chance in hell I could put it together. And then one day I'm like, just do it. Just try it. You can read instructions. And I did it. <laughs> I still have never used it. But but yeah, that just <laughs> having <laughs> confidence. I thought, in I thought elliptical machines were just for hanging your laundry on. <laughs> I, I actually do have a sweater hanging. <laughs> exactly. That is what they're for. <laughs> That's what they're for. It's just an absolute pleasure. I can't wait to keep talking about this. And uh, maybe, I don't know what uh what what's next um in terms of what you you have in mind but uh but i'm game for anything um to try and get this out to try and you know get humanities people in particular to maybe give us a shot and see how their students react yeah i might i, I can nominate you for a ted talk i just realized i was looking into like how to oh, that would be cool <laughs> if you want that <laughs> but yeah uh, but honestly and also if people want to is it okay if they reach out to you like um yeah. is your yeah okay I email, I email d miller at ubishops.ca yeah okay. Perfect. And I'll include that too. So yeah, feel free to reach out because I lots of students I, I know will love this. Um, lots of academics listen. So feel free to reach out. And yeah, next talks will be we'll definitely have like students coming in and giving their their um, sort of experience with it and what they're learning. So thank you again for being here, Daniel. This has been so amazing. Thank you.